Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there, out there in internet land. This is your friend, Charlie Hunter, with Kat Charbonneau on my lap. Kat Charbonneau has been out in the rain and is nice and damp and is eager to share the damp with, with, with me, and he'd be eager to share it with you as well. Anyway, today we're talking about seizing the moment. Because, as my friend Stan Ridgway wrote in his song, Crow Hollow Blues, you never know when God is going to kick you off of the ride. And I had a friend. I had a friend, of course, as ever, as ever. We have Betty Sue running tech, though, instead of her being in Austin, Texas, she's upstairs. And so I've had Betty Sue all this month. It's been a wonder, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a wonder. And Charbonneau always thought it's been a wonder, too. But Betty Sue, could we have a, the picture of our friend Shane Harris? Can we have a picture of that on the screen? This is our friend Shane Harris. Ow, ow, ow. Gosh, Charbonneau. Off. Um, Shane, this is taken by our friend Lori LaRue. Shane Harris was a plein air painter and a policeman and a social services guy. And at age 50 last week, he had a heart attack and died. And while that is very, very sad, and I mourn that he was, he was really looking forward to uh, retirement in a year or two. I think it was like 10, 18 months. Uh, and he was going to start going out onto the plein air circuit at that time. And I was really looking forward to telling him, you know, oh, these are ones I can recommend you to. These are ones you have to apply to. You know, these are invitational. Um, and it's very sad that that is not going to happen. But the thing I want to really point out is that he died at age 50 but he amassed a really strong body of work. And he, just look at how he has improved over the years. Um, Shane started out, let's have the first slide, Betty Sue. Shane started out um, painting as a kid. His mom uh, did art and he enjoyed painting along with her, but apparently, and at the memorial service, uh, several people told this story. Um, apparently when he started painting, he would get very frustrated. His paintings didn't look like his mother's paintings. And she said, they're not supposed to. My paintings look like I did them. Your paintings look like you did them. And that was a lesson that Shane really took to heart. And he, and it is very much of a piece with what Richard Schmidt used to say of that the act of painting is what made connected us as humans. Uh, it, it let us see what the world looked like through someone else's eyes. So Shane loved painting outdoors. And he, he got serious about painting in the mid 2000 teens, whatever we call those. And before his shift as a cop, early in the morning, he'd go out and paint, or in the evening, he'd go out and paint. He loved painting water. He loved painting rocks. He was a rocks and water guy. I'm not a rocks and water guy. Uh, but Shane came to me in 2016 through our friend, mutual friend, Ray Masuko. He had asked for an introduction. <laughs> and he came to my studio with a bunch of paintings and said, what do you think? And, you know, he was a cop in town. I'm not about to say to the cop, uh, they're okay. I was like, no, I mean, you, and, and, and you give people encouragement. I said that, you know, they, they really show, you know, they show you've been working, um, they show promise. Um, you know, that's, that's really neat. He was like, no, what, what do they need? And this is, is, this is one step more advanced than what his stuff looked like when he came by my studio the first time. But you'll notice the colors are a little bit hot. They're a little bit sharp, it seems to me. 
the edges of the rocks are a little too defined. He is doing that thing that we all tend to do, which is to signal to the viewer, this is an individual rock and this is an individual rock, or this is an individual whatever. But being overly defining with the edge, kind of outlining and then filling in the paint. And so what I said to him was, when I look at your work, I see a strong sense of composition, because this is this is a strong composition. This is, you know, you, you know, there's a definite subject, there's definite feel, you know, excellent composition, very good color sense. Um, but what I really see as the weak point is your edges. I would really work on edges. And at the memorial service, person after person who spoke said that Shane was a sponge. That if he, if, if he asked, how do you do something? And was told how you did it. He learned how it was done. He learned how to do it. He was an expert woodworker. People said, you know, if they had problems with air compressors, they'd call up Shane because chances were he'd know how to fix that. Anyway, he really listened to what I and a bunch of other people, you know, I think he's watching a lot of YouTube videos, um, what others were doing, and he worked and he worked. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. So this is a year later, this is 2017, an eight by 16, and I'm sure all of these are plein air. I, I don't know for certain, but uh, I believe I believe that, that that is primarily how he worked. But look at the edges on this. I think it's a whole step above that previous one. He's not defi defining every single tree. He's letting the mass of the tree really of the trees really work as one large unit with the bits of light coming through. I think the colors are less abrupt. Um, one year, one year going from uh, that that kind of harsh first one to this one. At about this time, I think it was, uh, I invited him to come down and join us for a get together of the Putney painters. And much as I suspected, Richard Schmidt loved Shane because Shane was also a goofball. He was he was he was a funny guy. Uh, but he was intense about his painting. But Schmidt loved people who had lives outside of just their painting. And one of the hallmarks of the Putney painters was that there were a bunch of people who were professional artists, but then there were also people who loved to paint who Richard thought were, were interesting. Dick McNeil, who was a, a commercial airline pilot. You know, Richard thought that was great. Uh, let's have Dick be a Putney painter. So I introduced Shane and Richard invited Shane to come back and paint with us anytime. And I believe it was in 2017 that he invited Shane to formally become a Putney painter. And believe me, believe you me, Shane took advantage of that because he obviously can see the influence of, of Schmidt there. Um, and I, oh, one of the things I was saying to Betty Sue, oh, Two things. One of the things I was saying to Betty Sue was that Shane and I were going to have to have a heart to heart at some point as he was getting better and better as a painter. Uh, I was thinking when he goes out onto the plein air circuit, he's got to stop signing them Shane, which is, you know, you can just see that through line of the 12 year old or the eight year old signing Shane to now this, this, this man who is starting to move to the next phase of his life as a serious painter, still signing it Shane, but was gonna, he was gonna have to, he's gonna have to change that. Um, but the thing I wanted to mention about Schmidt was, if you remember at the beginning of, or at the end of April, uh, after Richard moved on to his next great adventure, I proposed sending out a copy of Alla Prima, uh, Alla Prima II, uh, to those of you who listen to the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. And Vicki Lenz up in Canada has had it since 
uh, I guess about May 1st. So I keep forgetting and I took a week off or a couple of weeks off, but it is time for the next person to get Alla Prima for like a month because it's a 85 or $120 for a copy of the book. It's a great value and you should all buy it, but it is, uh, it is expensive. Um, so if you would love to read Alla Prima 2, just mention that fact in the comments and we'll choose uh, someone and Vicki will send the book to you. Vicki, if you're listening, please inscribe the book before you send it on to the next person. And next person, when you get the book, you have to promise to do the color charts, but when you get the book, you'll have it for a month and then we'll choose someone else and send it on to them. And you inscribe it before you send it on as well. So here we are in 2017. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. By 2018, um, this is this is oh no, this is also 2017. This is just typical, but it, I, I I show it because it has rocks and water. Um, I there are parts of it that I don't love as much, but I do love that the edges of the rocks is let go from what where they were a year before. Um, the again the mass of the trees, the composition is real strong. See that big ma dark mass in the upper right, uh, and it's broken up by the rocks and the verticals of the trees. And then there's the light uh, of the further hill. And then those nice verticals cutting into the sky. That's what stitches the painting together on the left-hand side, the conifer, and then the three uh, deciduous trees. They stitch from the sky down through the far hills, across the water, and into the near plain. So that ties that whole area together. If those, if those verticals weren't there, I think the composition would not work nearly as well. Then in the kind of the center foreground bottom, the light area there is a really nice counterpoint. It ties into the rocks on that far shore, not the far, far shore, but the, the near far shore. And I also am fond of this painting because this is our this is our water source, um, which is why we all have Jardia in Bellows Falls. No, it's it's a it's a natural pond. It's way up high above the village, um, so we we have gravity fed water. This is Menard's pond, and this is a play. There's a trail around the pond, and this is one place where there's a very rickety pile of logs that you kind of make your way over. Um, so I, I love this just because it's a, a very good capture of that spot. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. So this is, this is where Shane had gotten by 2018. And look at how the level of sophistication has increased. He's got this sweeping landscape pulling you back. I mean, it's a dance from, and it's, he didn't overly define anything. And it looks almost photographic, the lushness, the coarse lushness of the foreground, which is just so beautiful, painterly. It's, it's just, it's, it's beautifully painted. And then it goes back and then you've got those farm buildings with those little spots of light. Um, so the sharpness of those buildings against this, this natural world, you know, beautiful things of God, things of man, juxtaposition. And then that dramatic sky. I mean, there, there's, there's, this is just such an elegant painting. So in the space of two years, Shane's work had improved so exceptionally. And it was because he worked. He drew all the time. He had a sketchbook. Oh, and at the memorial service, this is, at the memorial service, they had Shane's sketchbook out on a table. And they kept saying, if if people want to do a sketch in there, because there, 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 there were the cops over there, there were the folks who he knew from social services over here, there were all family and friends over here, and then there were like five of us artists clumped together. Um, and they kept saying, if you want to do a sketch in the sketchbook, you should. And it was getting toward the end of the service, and I was going back and forth in my mind. 
oh, is it arrogant of me to do a sketch or would they like it if I did a sketch? So I grabbed the sketchbook and I grabbed a pen and it was really the wrong pen for the sketchbook. And it was a lousy sketch, ladies and gentlemen. It was a lousy sketch. But I hope it was still the appropriate thing to do. I just did it of the hills and the trees. It was on the, the memorial service was on his front lawn at uh, he lived he lived next to a marsh. And I just did a sketch of that. But he sketched all the time, which is that is if if anybody's gotten anything out of the reasonably fine art talks, please sketch daily if you can. I've been terrible this month. I've been working on the Bellows Falls Opera House project. Have not been doing much art, but uh, if you can sketch every day, that is what is going to make your art really start to work. And then at least two days a week, he would do a painting, and he did it pretty religiously. And he 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 had a group of a group of us would go out and paint. Occasionally, this is outside of Putney Painters, um, but he had a he had a group that he would check in with about are are you going out painting? Laurie Larue and he used to paint often. But the thing you can learn from him is he did not treat art as if it was something that he would just quickly master. He understood that it's a continuum, and he got so far advanced from where he had been before, simply by putting in the time. You know, there's the saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And Shane, although he left us way too young, he understood that. And when he started to do his art seriously, he did his art seriously. And he has left a legacy of very, very good paintings, and he won't be forgotten soon. So I urge you all, get your sketchbook. It's summer. Sit out on your deck, have a cup of coffee, and do a half hour sketch or 20-minute sketch every day. All right? And again, if you want a copy of, if you want the one-month loaner of uh, Alla Prima 2, just make a notation down uh, in the comments and we'll choose one of you. Until next week, you take good care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.